James W. Chesbro is Distinguished Professor of Telecommunications in the Department of Telecommunications at Ball State University. Dr. Chesbro served as President of the Eastern Communication Association in 1983 and President of the National Communication Association in 1996. He has served as the editor of several journals including Review of Communication, Critical Studies in Media Communication, and Communication Quarterly. Among several honors, he has been awarded the NCA's Golden Anniversary Award and the Samuel L. Becker Distinguished Service Award, and twice received ECA's Everett Lee Hunt Scholarship Award. He also received the Distinguished Research Fellow, Distinguished Teaching Fellow, Distinguished Service Award, and the Eckroyd Distinguished Teaching Award from the Eastern Communication Association. Dr. Chesbro has published over a hundred articles in communication journals and published several books, including Analyzing Media, Communication Technologies as Symbolic and Cognitive Systems, Extensions of the Burkean System, Computer Mediated Communication, Human Relationships in the Computerized World, Public Policy Decision Making, Orientations to Public Communication, and co-edited the third edition of Methods of Rhetorical Communication, a 20th Century Approach. For the 100th anniversary of the Eastern Communication Association, Dr. Chesbro edited a collected volume about the impact the association had on the field of human communication for Oxford University Press titled, A Century of Transformation, Studies in Honor of the 100th Anniversary of the Eastern Communication Association. Let's welcome Dr. James W. Chesbro to Communicast. You recently published A Century of Transformation, Studies in Honor of the 100th Anniversary of the Eastern Communication Association with Oxford University Press. What initially led you to champion this project? Oh, well, it, uh, to be very honest with you, it really started back on the 75th anniversary of ECA. I was the editor of Com Quarterly at the time, the, the Association's Journal, and at the 75th anniversary, I'd run several different articles about that uh, that anniversary, and I was also so aware of Tom Benson working on the 75th anniversary volume, which I really remember vividly. He got out a year and a half after the um, 75th anniversary, so we went to that 75th anniversary. There was no volume. He stood up and said, well, it's going to be about a year late. And I really remember all that. And so when we were coming up on the 100th, I said, for one thing, let's do it early enough so that we can have the volume at the convention, at the 100th anniversary convention itself. So we started five years early. Uh, the executive uh, council appointed a 100th anniversary committee. And one of our tasks was to uh, so, uh, set up the volume. And actually, we went back to Benson first and asked him to edit the 100th anniversary volume. We thought that was, I did particularly, thought it was kind of appropriate. But Tom said no and uh, decided to back off on any more activities with ECA. I think he's thinking about retiring. And so the committee then had to pick a new editor. But that's kind of how it all got started. I think it was a fait accompli. We pretty much knew there was going to be a volume. There had been at the 25th, 50th, and 75th. So it was kind of like history, uh, pulling some weight here and tradition kind of carrying it, that there would be a 100th anniversary volume. And speaking of history, during your preparation for this book, you had a chance to examine the Eastern Communication Association's archives. What did you learn about the struggle to create an identity for the field of communication? Yeah, I am the archivist for the association also. I have been for over 20 years. And so I've gone through uh, the archive in so many different ways. And one of the ways is we're reorganizing it now and we're uh, actually bringing up the archive online for, with EBSCO in Boston. And so I've been redoing the entire archive and organizing it as presidential papers. So I've really been starting to really focus on each little, the major presidents, in my view. We'll get them all before we're done. And I watched to see what each one was thinking of and how they were thinking. And at different times in different places, there are 
you, the identity of the association and discipline has different meanings and different uh, formulations going on. Um, for me, the most powerful kind of breakthrough, well, I should say first, Madge Kramer had this idea at the 50th anniversary, and she was the archivist of ECA in her day, and I went through her folder very carefully, and I saw what she was starting to think about, and she started to want to redefine the founder of the association differently. And uh, I see, and she wrote about 25 letters to people all over asking about that founding moment. And she wound up then arguing that Wichelms, uh, Winans, excuse me, Winans, was indeed the person who thought up the association first. So at the 50th, that's where she was and what she was doing, and then she became president also of ECA at that time. And so I think uh, you're very aware of it, that they were going through a different kind of struggle. For us at this point, uh, at, at the 100th anniversary, uh, I really think we're so much more, more aware of how dramatic and dynamic the discipline is how much it changes, and how much we have to be prepared for change and think that way. For example, on the 100th anniversary, I asked each of the authors to go back 25 years, essentially, to the 75th volume, and I even asked them to look at the 75th. But then I said, also, each chapter should contain a conception of where you think we're going to go. And... Not that everyone's got a crystal ball that works very well, but I thought it would be interesting for people later to see what we were thinking about, what we were anticipating our future to be. But it all permeates a kind of sense of change that's going on. And I think that's now part of our discipline. We survive because we have changed and adapt. And if you just compare the 50th anniversary for example, to the hundredth, the dramatic transformations, the subdivisions, the specializations that have gone on are tremendous. And I think I'm aware of that, and I think almost everybody is, that we really are dynamic, change-oriented. That's part of our identity, too. Plus, um, I think we still have some degree of a quest for respectability as a discipline concern that people appreciate us, uh, see us as powerful. Maybe we're not the psychology department or the tradition of history, but I think we're pretty close to that now, and I think respectability um, is equally important to the discipline. I think particularly when I think back to 1970 or so when we had uh, some of the conferences that established rhetoric and social science. There we really were establishing a sense of who we are and defining that. Now I take it with this 100th anniversary volume, these areas, the areas of application and theory, are pretty solid and respectable for the people involved. Um, I don't think they go through any anxiety now that uh, people are going to respect me, but I think it is the dimension of what our discipline's gone through. Breaking from English a hundred years ago, finding our who were our founders, what were they saying, up into the, even the first fifty years, and now a sense that we are researchers, publishers, we have our own subdivisions and areas. So that's where I think all of those questions have shaped our identity. Now, from the first ECA conference held in Philadelphia to the 100th conference held again in Philadelphia, how had the association evolved? Oh, so many different ways, so many different transformations in the association. Um, I would let me just point to a few, admitting very clearly I'm being very selective here. Um, I think one of the most important changes was just giving the members the vote on more and more things, uh, deciding, for example, that for initially the executive council picked the president of ECA. Now, of course, 
the nominations come from the members and the members do the voting. That kind of democracy, trusting the members. But more important, especially on the academic agendas and structures when we created the interest groups, that's when we really said that the members are in charge of our areas of application. And I remember uh, uh, your friend and my friend, Jim McCroskey, led that battle and really uh, created the subdivisions, the interest groups, the way we know them today, and allowed for more and more to be created and for some to be dissolved when they were no longer functional. And that movement in the uh, late 60s, early 70s, really said that the members and democracy was a part of the professional association. In that same day, in the second change, I think, really was when women were increasingly viewed as potential and actual leaders. The gender issue, sexism, really started to dissolve. Um, certainly, we had women early on in the discipline. Uh, but uh, March, uh, Madge Kramer, for example, really points that out as president at the 50th. But it really wasn't until the 80s when all of a sudden the majority of the presidents were all women, and no one really much even thought about it. But it was another transformation, a change in uh, the whole association. So the uh, question, the shift to democracy in every respect and the elimination of sexism. Another thing, of course, was racism. Debbie Atwater was the first president of any um, communication association, and she was African-American. Uh, so Eastern kind of led the way on that one as well. So I think all these changes um, have started to make a difference in what we are. There's so many others I could think of, I think, but you get, I think those are, constitute some of the important ones, at least from my point of view. Now, in a century of transformation, you invited a variety of different scholars to write chapters about their specific area. How were the various chapters uh, determined, and how did you decide which authors to get for these chapters? Um, let's see. Well... First of all, it wasn't just me. Uh, we really used a committee of seven of us. And we spent about five years on this project. Uh, it was myself, Borisov, Deborah Borisov, Susan Drucker, Ann Freeman, uh, Linda Linderman, Jim McCroskey, Janet Turner. And we met periodically on all of those questions. Um, uh, to be honest, we began like the uh, topics for the chapters, how which would be the content of each chapter. We went back to Benson's book, the 75th, and we started there. But then a lot of the interest groups had emerged since then, and we wanted to capture, reflect that. Some there were really some dramatic changes going on in some of the in the association, like we in the 50th, for example, it was mass communication, and slowly but surely that shifted towards media, and Benson himself did a lot of the work that made that shift occur. Um, and so we started picking up the areas as best we can that reflected the tradition, but also some changes, especially as the structure of the association had occurred, uh, what was changing, we tried to capture those. On the authors, this really was a very tough one um, because we wanted authors who had an established reputation in each of those areas, but they also had to be uh, kind of prolific writers, both officially and uh, just able to produce a manuscript because we're asking for it on demand. We need the manuscript to publish it by a certain deadline. And that's not how most academic research gets done. But um, what we focused in on them was the lead author of each of the chapters. And then we to make sure that lead author 
would do the job, we also encourage that lead author to pick a co-author or even two co-authors that would help them, that would allow them to get the chapter done on time. And so we focus mostly on the lead author and then knowing there would be additional. In some cases, we went further and actually helped put together co-authors, but mostly it was the lead authors that did that. Like on the interpersonal chapter, though, the committee really made a difference. Borisov was our lead, but we wanted somebody, because interpersonal has such a strong educational bent, we picked Pam Cooper because she has a book with several editions in uh, common education. And then we also wanted to make sure that mediated interpersonal was there, so we uh, encouraged them to consider David McMahon. So that's how that through those three co-authors emerged, but generally speaking, the lead author of each one of each of the chapters was the person who determined who their co-authors would be. Then we, of course, had to pick those lead authors, and in every case, we tried to pick someone who we thought was the leading scholar in the discipline. Now, to be honest with you, the executive council of ECA said, these people should be in the eastern region. I'm not sure the committee paid that much attention to that criterion as I think the executive council wanted us to. We were going for the top scholar in every area who could also write an essay within the kind of time frame we had in mind. And so uh, <coughs> we would then go through each of the areas one by one, trying to figure out who that was. And, for example, we would all, all seven members of the committee would bring a candidate or two. We'd talk through all of those candidates and rank order, and then I would approach them one by one in the rank order we had determined. In some cases, it was easy. Like Dennis Gowran had written a chapter on small group communication on the 75th anniversary volume and he did again for the 100th. But we also, in that case, really did a kind of extensive review of his 75th anniversary chapter and gave him some suggestions on how we thought uh, that chapter might be better for the 100th anniversary. And he was very open to it and flexible, and I think that enhanced the chapter he wrote, at least broadened it um, beyond the kind of corporate framework he initially was using and included things like Bowman's fantasy theme analysis and all these other things. That's in small group communication now. And we just went through that process for every single one of the chapters, all the best candidates, rank ordering them, then approaching them and seeing if they were willing and could do it by the deadline we had in mind. That worked pretty well. We did drop a few areas um, because of that approach, um, we just, in some cases, we just couldn't get the chapter done in time to include it in the 100th anniversary volume. A good example of that would be critical cultural uh, communication analyses. By the time we thought we had an author for that chapter, the book was already too far gone, and we really couldn't have, uh, get that chapter done. So that approach never got included. Um, otherwise, we would have had six chapters on those approaches to the study rather than five. And so, roughly speaking, that's how we did all that. The last question that I have for you is, in your final chapter of the volume, which you titled Keeping the Faith on Being a Teacher Scholar in the 21st Century, you charged four prominent scholars um, to discuss how they think the future of the field of communication is going to change over the next 25 years. Unfortunately, you never got to answer this question yourself. So how do you think the future of our discipline is going to change over the next 25 years? Well, first on that chapter, I have to really admit, I saw the, all the chapters before it kind of reflected a kind of liberal bias. And I really thought we needed a kind of more conserving traditional voice being, to close the volume. And 
Hahn and Blankenship had argued so much about this, and Kerner Muir came in there as well. And so that's why I think when they hearken back that we're going to focus in on the individual student communicating face-to-face, that's where I thought the tradition of the discipline came from, and I was pretty sure they'd encourage us to try to shape the future towards that again. For myself, I'm not sure I have that frame of reference at all about the future. Um, I do think the education part is going to be overwhelmingly important, but I, I'm not sure we're going to have the model of the individual citizen speaker as our goal or as our direction. I think we're increasingly going to have be dealing with technology, dealing with the role in which technology is playing and shaping communication, different kinds of ways in which that happens. And let me give a good ex- an example for me that really rings true. Uh, for example, most of our interpersonal courses now really talk about interpersonal communication as a face-to-face uh, risk-taking process that's accomplished verbally, non-verbally within a here and now space. I really think increasingly um, technology mediated in a personal is going to really shape so much of that process. And we can make fun of some of the research on it now, like eHarmony has some really self-serving research that they've been promoting and using, but I really do think we've seen in five years a massive growth of Facebook to internationally to 315 million people on one system, and MySpace is the same way where you make friends is what their motto is, and I really do think technology is going to be the foundation for a kind of linking consciousness that's going to put people together in the uh, time and space are not going to be that powerful as defining variables given what technology can do. And I'm thinking in 25 years, really will start doing in terms of the future of communication. Now, you actually wrote one of the probably the first book on computer-mediated communication back in the 80s. <laughs> You're one of the few people in the world who know that. <laughs> yeah, I wrote a me- computer-mediated communication came out two years, three years before the Internet. And so, yeah, uh, it's a fond point of view of mine. And when I had gone to Queens College in the 80s, And at Queens at that time, it was the largest communication department in the country in terms of number of majors. And every faculty member had to have their own medium. It was a media communication department at that point. And there were like six or seven people in film, German film, Italian film. Television was just covered. And I really was intrigued by computers. So I went over to computer science and start really working with those people. And the first article I ever wrote in that art regard was the rhetoric, the rhetoric of computer science, which I read to the computer science department, and they almost booed me out of the room. They really said they are really regulated by programs. They're immune to rhetoric in any form. And that's how I started, really. Vicious set of attacks on that. But then uh, computer-mediated communication started to become more and more real. Now, at this point, we didn't have the Internet. And I remember my first survey, uh, (laughs) none of the sites, uh, various sites were linked, and there were about 600 different sites I thought were socially oriented, and I did a survey of 60 of them, 10% sample. And that's how I started talking about interpersonal communication occurring on a computer system, which the interpersonal people just denied up and down. They said, no, that can't happen. You must be face-to-face in order to have interpersonal communication. And I thought that was strange because for me it was the functions, 
the symbol they used then that defined it, not so much the geo, geography, but a lot of people said geography. You have to be a foot and a half from somebody or it's not an interpersonal. So, yeah, I had worked on uh, computer media communication for a long time. And even in the 100th anniversary, Holmes and I have a chapter on digital communication and where it's taken us. Where do you think that's going to go since you've been so prolific about it in the past? Well, I think I, I start zooming out and starting so sounding so science fiction-y when I do this. But for me, if I were going to pick a prototype now that I think is going to start to dominate systems, social networking systems, I would think Second Life, <coughs> excuse me, Second Life is really going to be a real frame of reference. Now, it's not the most popular social networking uh, system now, but you create an avatar, a conception of yourself within the social network. That self is uh, interacts with other selves, other avatars. And I think we're going to start seeing more and more of that kind of thing. Um, like on Facebook, it may not be with an avatar, but you use a whole series of different kinds of pictures of yourself. And some analyses uh, have suggested there's a theatrical portrait portrayal going on in those pictures, and I'll buy that too. But that's kind of what I mean by the avatar frame of reference. There is a conception of the self there that somehow seems unbelievably important. I mean, if you track, do a more analysis on where people go from one uh, site to another, the people going to MySpace, the next site they go to is Facebook. And Facebook people, the next thing they go to is MySpace. So they're really moving backwards and forwards inside of these social networks, creating a sense of the self that's very important to them. Now, I teach these kids. That's all I teach here at Ball State. I'm teaching uh, the digital world, the introduction course for all the kind of geeks in the university. And so many of them find social satisfaction inside of these social networks. And some of them, when you look at them, you can see that, that they really don't have the nonverbal images that would allow them to succeed a lot in face-to-face environments, but they could on a social network. And so it's kind of, to me, I see more and more of a, a kind of whole reality emerging on these uh, social network systems. And I think that that whole reality is going to be a, a reality just as important as face-to-face reality or religious realities or physical realities, all of that. So to me, that's where it's going to go. Now I'm thinking in terms of 25 years, we'll start pulling whole systems that will seem equally powerful as face-to-face as all these other types of realities we have. Do I seem too wacko for you? (laughs) Not at all. We've been talking to Dr. James W. Chesbro about his new book, A Century of Transformation, Studies in Honor of the 100th Anniversary of the Eastern Communication Association. Thank you, Dr. Chesbro, for speaking to us today on Communicast. You got it. Bye-bye. Communicast is a production of the Communication and Media Department at SUNY.